So, you know, when people look at Moore's law, they often talk about it as just, so the exponential function is actually um, a stack of S curves. Mm -hmm. So basically it's you milk or whatever, take a, the most advantage of a particular little revolution and then you search for another revolution. And it's basically yes. revolutions stack on top of revolutions. Mm -hmm. Do you have any intuition about how the heck humans keep finding ways to revolutionize things? Well, first, let me just unpack that first point that I talked about exponential curves, but no exponential curve continues forever. Mm -hmm. um, it's been said that if anything can't go on forever, eventually it will stop. <laughs> and and that's very profound. It's very <laughs> profound, but it's it seems uh, that a lot of people don't appreciate that half of it as, as yeah. well either. And that's why all exponential functions eventually turn into some kind of S curve or, or, or stop in some other way, maybe catastrophically. And that's of happened with COVID as well. I mean, it was, it went up and then it, it sort of, you know, at some point it starts saturating the, the pool of people to be infected. Um, there's a standard epidemiological model that, that's based on that. Um, and it's beginning to happen with Moore's law or different generations of computer power. It happens with all exponential curves. The more remarkable thing, as you allude in the second part of your question, is that we've been able to come up with a new S curve on top of the previous one and do that generation after generation with new materials, new processes, and just extend it further and further. Um, I don't think anyone has a really good theory about why we've been so sex successful in doing that. Um, it's great that we have been, and uh, I hope it, it continues for some time, but it's, uh, it, you know, one beginning of a theory is that there's huge incentives when other parts of the system are going on that clock speed of doubling every two to three years. If there's one component of it that's not keeping up, then the economic incentives become really large to improve that one part. It becomes a bottleneck, and anyone who can do improvements in that part can reap huge returns so that the resources automatically get focused on whatever part of the system isn't keeping up. Do you think some version of the Moore's Law will continue? Some version, yes, it are it is. I mean, one version that has um, become more important is something I call Kumi's Law, which is uh, named after John Kumi, who I should mention was also my college roommate. But he identified the fact that energy consumption has been declining by a factor of two. And for most of us, that's more important. You know, the new iPhones came out today as we're mm -hmm. recording this. I'm not sure when you're going to uh, make it Very available. Very soon after this, yeah. Um, and for most of us, you know, having the iPhone be twice as fast, you know, it's nice, but having it, the battery life longer, that would be much more valuable. And the fact that a lot of the progress in chips now is reducing energy consumption um, is probably more important for many applications than just the raw speed. Other dimensions of Moore's law are um, in AI and machine learning. Um, those tend to be very parallelizable functions, um, especially uh, deep neural nets. And uh, so instead of having one chip, you can have multiple chips or you can have a, a, a GPU, a graphic processing unit that goes faster and now special chips designed for machine learning like tensor processing units. Each time you switch, there's another 10X or 100X improvement above and beyond Moore's law. So I think that the raw silicon isn't improving as much as it used to, but these other dimensions are becoming important, more important, and we're seeing progress in them. I don't know if you've seen the work by OpenAI where they show the exponential improvement of the training of neural networks, just literally in the techniques used. So that that's right. almost like the algorithm. The it's it's fascinating to think like, can I actually continue us, us figuring out more and more tricks on how to train networks faster well, and faster? The progress has been staggering. You know, if you look at image recognition, as you mentioned, I think it's a function of at least three things that are coming together. One, we just talked about faster chips, not just Moore's law, but GPUs, TPUs, and other technologies. The second is just a lot more data. I mean, we are awash in digital data today in a way we weren't 20 years ago. Uh, photography, I'm old enough to remember, it used to be chemical. And now everything is digital. I took a uh, you know, probably 50 digital photos yesterday. Um, I wouldn't have done that if it was chemical. And and we have um, the Internet of Things and all sorts of other types of data. Our, when we walk around with our phone, it's just broadcasting a huge amount of digital data that can be used as training sets. And then last but not least, um, as they mentioned at OpenAI, op as they mentioned at OpenAI, there have been significant improvements in the techniques. You know, the core idea of deep neural nets has been around for a few decades, 
but the advances in making it work more efficiently have also improved a couple of orders of magnitude or more. So you multiply together, you know, a hundredfold improvement in computer power, a hundredfold or more improvement in data, hundredfold improvement in uh, in techniques of software and algorithms, and soon you're getting into millionfold improvements.